Well, hi, everyone. My name is Matt, and I'm really excited. We're starting a, a brand new series today. And I would like really all of us over the next several weeks to wrestle together with this question. Why do I love Jesus? I mean, why do you love Jesus? And that is actually, as I hope we find, a deeper question than you might think. Oddly enough, it's a question that perhaps many of us have never actually thought about before. And so answers like, um, because he died for me, or I guess because he's Jesus, those are great, those are fine, but why else? Uh, what about him specifically uh, are you drawn to? I mean, if I asked you why you love your spouse or significant other or best friend or parent, I hope you'd have more to say than just uh, they birthed me when I didn't do anything to deserve it. Or like, I guess I love them because they're just them. Uh, and, and here's why this is such an important question when it comes to Jesus. The New Testament uses the word Christian to describe us only three times in the whole New Testament. The New Testament also uses the word disciple to describe us 268 times, which means the distinction is clear. We are called not simply to believe in Jesus, but to actively follow him as his disciple, his student, his apprentice is what that means. And as we've been saying around here a lot, a disciple is someone who's learning to be with Jesus so that we can, over time, become more like Jesus, so that we can do what Jesus did, or more specifically, so that you can do what Jesus would do if he were you. But here's the thing. We are not very likely, I don't think, to give serious energy to discipleship, to what we're called, if we're actually not compelled by Jesus, by who he fundamentally is. I and mean, we can talk all we want about discipleship and we're going to be talking about it all of next year, by the way. But the fact remains, it, you don't want to be with someone. You don't want to be like someone or emulate someone that you're not actually drawn to. And so the question is, is Jesus our ultimate love? Is he the pearl of great price? Is he the treasure that we seek? Why do you love Jesus? Now, a couple layers here because, first of all, we all have this picture we all have this mental image in our head of what Jesus is like, and you can think of attributes that come to mind, gracious, he's kind, he's loving, he's bold, whatever you think of. But I think for a lot of us, also in our minds, if we're honest, if we're honest, I, I think for a lot of us, Jesus is only partly, partly human, like he's kind of two-dimensional, like we see him in the Gospels, and it's almost like in our minds, he's, he's floating six inches above the ground like a phantom, that he, he's kind of flat personality-wise, that he just has these pithy one-liners that he speaks to people. Like, we actually don't think of Jesus as the life of the party, which is how the Gospels describe him. We don't think of Jesus as someone who would say to the most powerful ruler in the land, King Herod, uh, to tell him essentially to go fly a kite, only not that nice. What I'm saying is for a lot of us, our picture of Jesus is sadly two-dimensional. We have, for those of us who have Sunday school baggage with like the flannel graph imagery that hasn't left us, and that's like our picture of Jesus, or we all have larger kind of cultural assumptions that we've inherited, it just makes it very difficult to cut through that stuff, to see and to know Jesus as a real person, or we highlight the parts of Jesus that we like, and then we forget about the parts that we don't like. Listen, Jesus says things and does things that you don't remember him saying. He does. He, he's not always the person that we want him to be or that we think he is. Probably all of us, myself included, operate with like a half-right picture of Jesus, so what about the real person? And, and my contention is, you can't really love a person uh, you just have an abstract picture of in your head. Um, you, you know this, some of you, your idea of another person just based on their online dating profile 
Right? You got that information. Your imagination fills in the gaps with like who this person must surely be. That picture in your head is totally different than the flesh and blood real individual you get to know. Only, by the way, Jesus in that example is better once we get to know him. He's more than we thought. And so all that to say, my hope and my prayer uh, in this series is over the next several weeks, we develop a much more three-dimensional picture of Jesus, that we make room for him to be himself, that we'll discover in that that Jesus is more than we thought, not less, that in the end we'll, we'll be drawn to who he is. Because when that happens, when that happens at a heart level, following Jesus ceases to become something I ought to do. And instead, it becomes something that I am convinced at a soul level, I am deeply compelled there's no one else I'd rather give my life to or follow. So again, let's give Jesus space to be who he is, not who we imagine him to be, which for lots of reasons is easier said than done. So I want to shake up your picture of Jesus a little bit. And I hope when the dust settles that we can, we can actually have a fresh encounter uh, with this real person, okay? So what we'll start here, um, and just give me a minute. When you read the Gospels carefully, one of the things you find is that Jesus many times fails to meet people's expectations for who they thought the Messiah was supposed to be. That Jesus, in showing up the way he did and not in some other way. He's actually doing something on purpose um, that perhaps you haven't thought about. And I'm just telling you, when you see this, it's one of the fundamental reasons that I love Jesus. John, the gospel writer, begins his gospel in chapter 1, verse 9 this way. And he actually starts with a pretty shocking fact. He says, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and Jesus was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Now, this phrase here, he came to that which was his own, that could also be translated very simply, he came home. And the reason I know that is because other places in the New Testament where this Greek word shows up, it is translated as home. And so what John is saying is that when the word, when Jesus came into this world, he didn't come as an alien, as an outsider. He came home. More specifically, he came to Israel, to God's own people. John is saying Jesus didn't show up where he couldn't have expected to be known. No, he came home. He should have been welcomed uh, by, by people. But as John says, his own, for the most part, did not receive him. Why? Well, for one reason, uh, for starters, every Hebrew prophet up to that point had taught that one day God would install his kingdom on earth, that God would prove in person, in the person of the Messiah, which means his anointed one, that God had not forsaken them. You have the words of the prophet Isaiah, for example, in the Old Testament. And this was essentially the prayer, right up into the first century. The prayer was, God, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. Come down and cause the nations to quake before you. This is the essential minimum expectation for what the Messiah was going to accomplish. Uh, you had Jews right up in the time of Jesus who would set aside an empty seat at their table, Kind of a symbolic way of holding out hope for this person. We're saving him a seat. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine the, this crazy dream that this tiny little province, totally engulfed by the Roman Empire, would someday produce a worldwide ruler? The Jews actually believed that. They actually staked their future on this king who would come and lead their nation back to glory. Now, what this means is that in and around the time of Jesus, revolt was in the air. You could feel it. From time to time, these pseudo-messiahs would show up, and they would appear and lead rebellions, 
only to get crushed in these crackdowns from the Roman government. To give one example, a prophet known as the Egyptian showed up, attracted multitudes out into the wilderness where this Egyptian fellow, he proclaimed that at his command, the walls around Jerusalem would fall, signaling the beginning of the end. That's a pretty bold claim, isn't it? Uh, The Roman governor got wind of this and sent a detachment of soldiers out into the wilderness to find this guy. And on one day, they massacred 4,000 of these rebels. Now, just before Jesus began his ministry, there was another report that spread that said the long-awaited Messiah had turned up in the desert. So crowds flocked to see this wild man, John the Baptist, dressed in camel skin. Apparently, some people thought that John the Baptist was the Messiah, and so John had to clarify, you yourselves can testify that I said, please write this down, I am not the Messiah, but am sent ahead of him. And then he goes on, and he ratchets people's hopes even higher. He begins hyping. He begins exalting the one who was to come, Jesus And when Jesus arrives on the scene, John goes, right there, he's the one, that's the guy. What's interesting is that John himself, later on, starts having his own doubts about Jesus. John sends some people to ask Jesus this question, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? In other words, you're not doing some of the main things I thought the Messiah would do. This question, in a very real sense, is the question of the age. It's the question everyone's talking about, everyone, it's on everyone's minds. I mentioned this several years ago, but I I just can't get this out of my mind. In 1993, um, there was a Messiah sighting in the Crown Heights section of Brooklyn, New York. There were lots of Hasidic Jews living there who, at the time were convinced that the Messiah was dwelling among them in the person of Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson. I know what you're thinking. He doesn't look like the Messiah. (laughs) But people got all worked up, all this religious fervor. Word spread that he was the one. The lucky synagogue leaders um, who were lucky enough to have a network of beepers, it's in the 90s, right? that alerted them whenever this guy was supposed to make an appearance. And so one day, pagers started going off. People were excited. Men with black coats and curly sideburns racing down the sidewalks of Brooklyn. And they pack by the hundreds into this main hall of the synagogue. I mean, it was was mayhem. It was like a sporting event. Rabbi Schneerson was 91 years old. He had suffered a stroke the year before and had been unable to speak since. When the curtain was finally pulled back, those who crowded into the synagogue saw this frail old man with a long beard who could basically tilt his head and move his eyebrows. Not put off by this, the audience began to sing in unison over and over, long live our master, our rabbi, our king, Messiah forever. Just the anticipation, the excitement continued to build tangible energy in the room. And he comes out and he makes like a small gesture. And the curtain closes. And that's it. And people slowly filtered out, savoring this moment. And they left, they left essentially in a state of ecstasy. Spoiler alert. This was not the Messiah. Now... To us, the idea of a 91-year-old mute Messiah seems utterly absurd. It seems ridiculous, doesn't it? Like it's laughable. But I tell you that, though, because my reaction, and probably your reaction to hearing this, it's exactly how many people in the first century reacted to Jesus. Here's the problem, and I, I think it's actually helpful to put ourselves in their shoes for just a minute. When the one that John the Baptist pointed to arrived on the scene, neither the mountains trembled nor the nations quaked, as Isaiah prophesied. 
Jesus didn't come close to satisfying the hopes and the expectations of the Jews. In fact, the opposite happened. Within a few generations, Rome came in toward Jerusalem, the temple to the ground. Listen, when your Messiah dies at the hands of your enemy at age 33, when your nation goes downhill after your Savior's death, when the world gets more fractured, not less. I'm just saying, these facts did not seem to add up for the members of Jesus' own race. Within a few generations of, of Jesus' life, with very few exception, Jews stopped following him, and the church became mostly Gentile. Jesus failed to meet people's basic expectations on what the Messiah was going to do. And so they've been waiting for the true Messiah ever since. As John says, the world did not recognize him. When Jesus started his ministry, he goes around, he's teaching, he's healing. Do you know what his neighbors did? They scratched their heads and were just, it was just, they were flabbergasted. They said things like this. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary and aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where did this man get all these things? I mean, we knew him when he was in diapers. And they took offense at him. Other countrymen ridiculed Nazareth. Can anything good come from there? A Messiah from Galilee? Are you kidding me? A carpenter's kid? I mean, that's a bit much, don't you think? At one point, Jesus' own family tried to put him away, thinking he's out of his mind. The religious leaders tried to kill him. As for the average person, the common person who encountered Jesus, on the one hand, they thought he was demon-possessed and out of his mind, and then in the next instant, they wanted to make him king by force. Like they don't know, like they can't make up their minds about him. Now, here's the really strange thing. Jesus appears to be fully aware of this tension that I've just laid out. And on top of that, he actually seems to add to this tension like on purpose. He chooses a band of, a small band of followers. They have no permanent base of operation. They just wander from town to town. No discernible Strategy. Jesus says, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head, no permanent residence. This guy could not run for town council of Yorktown, would not be eligible. It's also strange that Jesus seems to have an amb ambivalence toward miracles. On the one hand, Jesus healed in spontaneous response, he'd see a need, he'd feel compassion, he'd heal a person in front of him. Not once does Jesus ever turn down a direct request for help. On the other hand, he certainly didn't advertise his powers. On multiple occasions, he expresses frustration of like, man, these people just want to be entertained and, and dazzled by a sign, like he's some sort of a sideshow. The gospel writer Mark records seven separate occasions when Jesus instructs a person that he healed to tell no one. Can you see how that's a strange way to start a movement? What's he doing? He's not meeting expectations. He's doing everything differently than people expect. At one point, his brothers come to him and they say, leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. In other words, Jesus, you need better marketing, right? You need to get out of these little backwater towns and villages and go to the big city. Go to where you're sure to get the recognition you deserve. That is, if you really are who you say you are. Jesus told them, my time is not yet here for you. Any time will do. Reading through the Gospels, you see Jesus most of the time preferred to keep out of the spotlight. He was suspicious of crowds, didn't care about public opinion. He spent most of his time in small towns that did not matter. Here's my point. Jesus was self-aware of the fact that he wasn't fitting the bill, that he wasn't adding up to people's most basic expectations for the Messiah. 
And I'm just saying, if you were going to make up a story about a man named Jesus who was the Messiah, the Son of God, you do not write a story like we find in the Gospels, like almost any of it. Jesus' most devoted followers usually come off scratching their heads in wonderment. Like, who is this guy? When you read them, the, the tone is more, they're more baffled than they are, we're going to cook up a conspiracy. <laughs> like, we don't know what's going on. Jesus himself, whenever he's challenged, he never offers airtight proof on his identity. He gives clues here and there. But then he'll say things like this. After appealing to the evidence, he'll say, oh, and by the way, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Blessed is anyone who continues to hold faith, hold on to faith in me even though I'm not what you thought. Reading the Gospels, it's hard to find anyone who does not at one point or another take offense at Jesus. You know, we sometimes use the term savior complex to describe someone with an unhealthy obsession with curing other people's problems. The irony is the true savior seemed remarkably free from such a complex. He had no compulsion to convert the entire world in his lifetime. He didn't try to cure people who weren't interested in being cured. What we find in Jesus is like an emotionally healthy adult. He has limits. He has boundaries. He knows who he is and who he isn't. He has tremendous respect for other people's space. Uh, when the rich young ruler turns and walks away from Jesus, unable to do what Jesus says, Jesus, what's he do? He lets him go. I'm sure he's saddened. But he's not going to try to convince the guy of something he's not ready for, even though he would have been a big catch for Jesus. When the crowds turn away from Jesus and many of his disciples abandon him, Jesus turns to the 12 and says, sadly, you don't want to leave too, do you? Can you hear the emotion in that? Like he's like a human? He's vulnerable? Notice that Jesus doesn't threaten them. He doesn't try to strong arm them. No guilt trips. This would have been a good time for a motivational speech. Not that either. He just goes, it's up to you guys. Are you going to stick with me or not? Your choice. You guys ever have tried, <clears throat> do you ever have someone try to sell you something? Yeah, like 24 hours a day, all day, every day. Notice when somebody's trying to sell you something, they always play up the upside, right? Uh, usually an emotional appeal or, you know, appealing to a fear. They also downplay the cost. You don't get to the fine print until after you've done the deal. And it's like, oh, right? They, they have a quick response to any objection that you raise. Jesus never does that. Never. Here's how bad of a salesperson Jesus was, okay? Here's his pitch. Here's his marketing slogan, his elevator pitch. Ready? That's a, tough, that's a tough one to lead with, isn't it? Take up your cross and follow me. Do you hear in this any hint of manipulation? None. Is Jesus trying to sell people on something or pull one over on other people? No. Jesus seems so settled on who he is and what he's about. It's almost like he has nothing to prove. <laughs> it's almost like he's not trying to convince anybody of anything. He doesn't show up driven by insecurities. Is this okay? Am I okay? Are you happy with me? He doesn't do that. No selfish motives. No need to defend himself. He is the most secure person who has ever walked the face of this earth. I'm starting to really like this guy. I mean, these are actually all things that I want to emulate. Like, I actually want to be like Jesus. I'm beginning to believe this is a person I can trust with my whole heart. The world did not recognize him, and for the most part, still doesn't. Why? If what John is saying is true... That in Jesus, God has taken on human flesh. God walked among us. Why didn't God make himself more obvious? 
Why deliberately open himself up, consciously self-aware, to all kinds of misunderstanding and misinterpretation and accusation? I mean, and it continues to today. You ask 10 random people today on the street who they think Jesus is, and guess what you get? 10 completely different answers. As it is, I just want you to sit with this. We are perfectly free to ignore Jesus and what God's done through him. We are perfectly free to live without restraint as if God did not exist. Do you realize how easy it would have been for Jesus to devise, to devise some irrefutable proof to silence all of these skeptics, to tilt the odds in God's favor once and for all? But as it is, God seems so easy to ignore. See, of all the things that you could say about God, think about God's characteristics. He's sovereign. He's in control. He's omnipotent and so on. I think the one characteristic about God that we have the hardest time grasping is the truth that Jesus shows us, that we have a God who takes risks on our behalf. I mean, you realize it took a lot of courage, a lot of vulnerability for God to lay aside his power and his glory and to take his place alongside human beings who he knew ahead of time, he knew they would greet him with the exact same mix of pride and skepticism that I felt when I heard about the Messiah sighting. And he knew that was going to happen. It was an act of complete vulnerability on the part of God to show up on a planet known for its violence, and specifically among a people with a long reputation of rejecting their prophets, like we would have done if we were there. Do you realize God could not have done anything more risky, more dangerous? He could not have made himself more vulnerable. Uh, there's a character in, named Ivan in Dostoevsky's novel, The Brothers Karamazov. And Ivan, in talking about Jesus, asks a question that I think is really important. He says, why didn't Jesus overwhelm the world with his power? Why didn't he use his power and his authority to once and for all show the world who he was? Ivan, in the novel, comes to call it the miracle of restraint. That when you step back and you look at the Gospels, it seems like Jesus over and over again makes himself really easy to reject. Of course, for God, the, the, the signs and wonders that the Pharisees demanded, the proof that I want to see, that, that's not a problem for an omnipotent God. Perhaps more amazing is his refusal. I'm not going to perform. I'm not going to overwhelm. He surrenders his greatest advantage. Think about this. His greatest advantage he surrenders, which is the power to compel or force belief. He lets it go. Satan's temptation of Jesus in the wilderness at its core is that Jesus take a shortcut. The whole thing is Satan trying to convince Jesus to become the thundering Messiah. Everyone, come on, we want you to be. Think about the temptation to turn stones into bread. What is that? It's the temptation to ignore fixed laws of hunger and agriculture, to enjoy bread without that. The second temptation to throw himself from the temple and to see if God would, in fact, save him. What's that? It's the temptation to confront risk with no real danger. The third temptation to get all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. It's a temptation to wear a crown, but not a cross. Do you realize Satan was, in a way, dangling in front of Jesus a speeded up way of accomplishing his mission. He could essentially win over the crowds by creating food on demand, and then he could take control of the kingdoms of this world all without exposing himself to any real danger. And yet Jesus, in the wilderness, focuses his power on the energy of restraint. Perhaps God knows that no display of power will achieve the response he desires. Yes, external power can force a lot of things. 
Power can coerce, power can manipulate. But get this, only love can call for a response of love, which is the one thing God wants and the reason he created us. Do you realize with enough power, coercion, bullying, manipulation, you can get people to do just about anything. But try forcing someone to love you. See, what Jesus was doing was something so much more personal than people realized. God made himself weak and vulnerable for for one reason, for one purpose, to let human beings, to let you and me freely decide for ourselves what we're going to do with them. Soren Kierkegaard, a philosopher, once wrote about God's light touch. He says, omnipotence, which can lay its hands so heavily upon the world, can also make its touch so light that the creature receives independence. This is exactly what God is doing in Jesus. He's making room for you. Now, I'll be the first to admit, I sometimes wish God used like a heavier touch. At times, I want God to like overwhelm me and to overcome my doubts with like stark, naked certainty. I want him to give final proof that he cares or that he exists. I want quick, spectacular answers to all my prayers. I want God without the ambiguity. You know what I really want in a lot of ways? I want the version of Jesus in the wilderness that Satan was trying to get him to be. The thundering Messiah who says, I want him to say yes to those those things he said no to Satan about. Of course, Jesus' approach is different. What he's actually trying to do is to very gently, very gently, bring transformation from the inside out. What we see in Jesus is that God's power, his way of working in the world, it actually resembles abandonment. He's actually giving up what is rightfully his. That God sets the terms of the relationship. As Karl Barth, the theologian, insisted so fiercely, God is free. He's free. He's free to reveal himself or conceal himself. He's free to intervene or not intervene. Get this. He's free to rule over the world or even be rejected and despised by the world. Actually, our own human freedom derives from a God who cherishes freedom. Parents in the room, you know kind of the tricky balance between guiding and manipulating your kids, that the goal of parenting is not to produce clones who replicate the lives of the parent, but rather to produce mature adults capable of making their own choices. God apparently, shockingly, errs on the side of human freedom. He subjects himself to our choices. Again, think about the risk he took to come to us. Up front, knowingly risk the likelihood that many, if not most, would reject him. God humbles himself so deeply, he somehow puts himself at our mercy. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says, do not put out the Spirit's fire. Ephesians 4.30 says, and do not, what a weird word, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do you realize you can only grieve or hurt someone who has emotions, someone who cares? You can only do this with someone who, in genuine relationship, opens themselves up to the risk that that might happen. God, in his mercy, allows himself to be grieved, ridiculed, forgotten, mocked. He knows that coercion has never worked very well in remaking people. He knows that even if everyone on this planet was 100% convinced that God exists, that the problem in the human heart would still remain. And so Jesus' mission is much more personal. Do you know what he's after? He's after your heart. And so he chooses the one approach that opens up the possibility, not the guarantee, but the possibility that you'll say yes to him. 
God says, I don't want to overwhelm your freedom. I don't want to crush you with my presence. Said another way, how can you have a genuine relationship with someone when the power dynamics are infinitely imbalanced? The only way to have a real relationship is for the person with the power to meet you on your level, on my level. And and God says, so I'm going to give you just enough in Jesus. I'm going to give you just enough to decide for yourselves, to be free to choose me, to respond to me in uncoerced love, which hopefully you know is the only kind of love there is. John goes on after the bad news, and he says, yet to all who did receive him, To those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. I love what theologian Helmut Felix says. The Christian stands not under the dictatorship of a legalistic you ought, but in the magnetic field of Christian freedom, under the empowering of the you may. Maybe God recognizes that we are the ones on the journey, not himself. Maybe God knows that that the direct presence of God would totally overwhelm us with sight-replacing faith. Perhaps God instead wants a different knowledge, a personal knowledge that requires our commitment to seek to know him. Maybe God knows that our search for God, our determined pursuit, that that's actually what changes us in ways that matter most. What this means for you in your journey, what this means is that the silence that you encounter, the darkness, the temptation, even our sufferings, that all of these things can actually add up to God's stated goal of shaping us into the people he intended, people more like his son. And so he comes to you and to me in the only way that creates this opportunity. Not as a dictator. Not with a legalistic, you ought or you should. But he comes with an invitation. You may. So here's what I want you to see in Jesus. Here's one reason why I love Jesus and find him so incredibly compelling. And it has everything to do with the way that he showed up when he walked this earth in complete vulnerability, with incredible personal risk, with no pretense. He's not trying to sell you anything, nothing to prove, no guilt trips. He never tried to compete for people's attention or overwhelm anyone. He never tried to derive his value or worth from other people. He was completely secure in who he was, in the Father's love. He was totally fine disappointing people, He knowingly, on purpose, failed to meet people's expectations. He simply spoke the truth in a way that, like a sane, healthy person does when they have nothing to prove because the truth speaks for itself. And then he respects people's decision. He makes all kinds of room for people to respond how they will, to reject him, to walk away, whatever. And I'm just saying to me, all of this adds up to a person I can actually trust. Does that make sense? I actually trust who this is. I'm actually, I actually believe he has my best interest at heart. He's not doing this for himself. I think that's hopefully clear. He's not doing this for what he can get out of it something else, which means I can trust also what he says. I'm inclined to believe him when he says that I have a father in heaven who loves me deeply. See, when that sinks in, when you see more clearly who Jesus actually is, at least for me, in my heart, I feel myself drawn more toward him, drawn by who he is. I I love this guy. Like there's nobody else like him. I find myself wondering, okay, what else does he know that maybe I don't? What else might he have to show me? See, Jesus comes to you the way he's appeared always to people that he loves. 
And I just want this to sink in. He makes room for you to decide what you're going to do with him. Which means he's not going to fight for your attention. He's not going to overpower you. He's not interested in coercion or overwhelming you. He comes to you gently, vulnerably, and it's incredible risk. Not with you ought or you should or with you may. He comes to you with an invitational posture, with empowering freedom. He gently invites us to lean in closer. Of course, saying yes to him, it may cost you everything, but then again, he told us that, like up front. Do you believe him when he says it's worth it? When you really see Jesus for who he is, a person who intentionally laid aside power and glory, who comes to you having done the work to level the playing field, the power imbalance, who shows up in complete vulnerability and says, you decide. You can't help but be drawn to and love a person like that. Would you stand with me? We'll pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would all have just eyes to see who you are more clearly. We would see Jesus more fully. Lord, all of this, at least to me, it explains why you invite us to spend time with you, and then you wait. And you don't badger us, and you're not, you're not pushy. You're just available, and you wait. Lord, I pray that when we see who you are more clearly, that our hearts would just be, would come alive and we would feel ourselves so drawn, so compelled by who you are that we'd want to follow you. We want to offer you our lives. Lord, I pray that you, in the next several weeks, you would just capture our imagination with Jesus. Draw us closer to yourself. Um, Lord, I pray that each one of us would tap into something in you that is so real that it would change us, that we would come away and, and we would be people about whom other people say, and that, that man, that woman has been with Jesus, and they're different. Thank you for the empowering freedom, the, the invitational posture you approach us with. Give us the courage to say yes, to be open to where, to where you want to lead us next. It's in Jesus' strong name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks, everyone, for worshiping uh, together with us. Have a great week. Enjoy the day, and we'll see you next week for part two of this. done for me